In mid-1917, Russia was in a state of total anarchy. In March, the Tsar had abdicated, and now two rival governments were vying for power. On one hand was the so-called Provisional Government, created to govern the country until a new constitution could be written. The Provisional Government was led by Alexander Kerensky, a man who was a brilliant speaker, but politically naive. The other government was the Petrograd Soviet, essentially the city council of the capital, Petrograd. The Petrograd Soviet had been formed in March and was much more radical than the Provisional Government. These two bodies were in a power struggle and the situation was hugely unstable. At the same time, Russia was still involved in World War I against Germany. The war had been a disaster and the army was beginning to disintegrate. In July, Russia's last offensive of the war was a total failure. It lost hundreds of thousands of men to the Germans and then hundreds of thousands more deserted. The old power structures were collapsing. Violence and chaos ruled the day. In the mayhem, numerous factions were planning how they could take power. By October of 1917, the most important faction within the Petrograd Soviet was the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin. In March, when the Petrograd Soviet had been created, the Bolsheviks had been only a small part of the assembly. However, over the course of the year, their power had grown, and by September, they were the largest party. In October, the Bolshevik-led assembly voted to oust the provisional government and become the sole authority in Russia. On November the 7th, the coup took place. Thousands of Bolshevik Red Guard occupied the government buildings of Petrograd and met little resistance. The takeover of Petrograd was mirrored in other cities across Russia. In Moscow, the fighting was particularly prolonged and bitter, but within a week, it had fallen. Almost all of the major cities in Russia were now under Bolshevik control. The capture of those cities was an astonishing success for the Bolsheviks. In the February Revolution, only eight months before, they had had almost no power in Russia. Now they controlled the major urban centers. The majority of the people were opposed to the Bolshevik takeover, but they were disproportionately peasants spread out over the vast Russian expanse. That made it very difficult for them to organize and form a counter-revolution. From those cities, the Bolsheviks were able to take advantage of the anarchy that afflicted Russia and expand their power into the surrounding countryside. Very quickly, they had control of almost all of European Russia. What would follow was a horrific power struggle involving numerous factions to wrestle power out of the Bolsheviks' hands. That power struggle was the Russian Civil War. Immediately upon the Bolsheviks taking power, revolts sprang up all over Russia. The former leader of the provisional government, Alexander Kerensky, escaped Petrograd and fled south to Peskov. There he was able to raise an army of 600 men to retake Petrograd. The small force was heavily outnumbered and quickly defeated. Fearing capture, Kerensky fled to France. In the east, near the town of Chita, a local politician named Grigory Semyonov declared his opposition to the Bolsheviks and started a rebellion. The Bolsheviks quickly suppressed the uprising and Semyonov was forced to withdraw east. In the south, various generals refused to recognize the new Bolshevik government and took control of the Don region. An army was recruited to fight the Bolsheviks that came to be known as the Volunteer Army. However, the Volunteer Army was small. The local people were not interested in joining the fight and so the army would remain only a few thousand. Nevertheless, in December, the Volunteer Army was able to take the city of Rostov. The Bolsheviks sent their own army to recapture the territory and the small Volunteer Army quickly began to fail. In February, it was forced to abandon Rostov and withdraw south. The loss of Rostov was a disaster for the Volunteer Army. One of the generals, believing that there was no hope of victory, shot himself. For the next two months, the Volunteer Army struggled to find a foothold in the area and clung on for survival. While all this was happening, Russia was still formally involved in World War I against Germany, 
In February, the Germans invaded large parts of the former Russian Empire, including Ukraine and the Baltics. This forced the Bolsheviks to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which formalized their withdrawal from World War I. For Russia's former allies, Britain and France, this was a disaster. They were still fighting Germany, and now all the German troops that had been fighting Russia were going to be transferred to fight them. In March of 1918, British troops landed in Murmansk in the far north of Russia. Initially, they were actually there to help the Bolsheviks stop the Germans capturing the town. However, relations quickly soured. The Bolsheviks sent a force to take control of Murmansk, but the British repelled them. This was the first direct fighting between the Western powers and the Bolsheviks. In April of 1918, a new group entered the war in the south, the Cossacks. The Cossacks were semi-nomadic people that live in the Ukraine and the Caucasus. They were famous as fearsome warriors and for their distinctive way of life. When the civil war broke out, the Cossacks hadn't initially wanted to involve themselves in the war. However, as the Bolsheviks had become more authoritarian, the Cossacks had become resentful and in April they revolted. Many of them wanted independence from Russia. As leader, they elected Peter Krasnov, a man from a prestigious Russian military family. Krasnov will be one of the most important commanders of the Civil War. Krasnov recruited an army that came to be known as the Cossack Army and quickly grew to 40,000 strong. He made contact with the Germans that were occupying Ukraine and even offered to form a German-controlled Ukrainian puppet state. In return, Germany gave him weapons and ammunition. Some historians have branded Krasnov an opportunist rather than a man with any real commitment to fighting the Bolsheviks. His willingness to work with the Germans meant that he would always be treated with suspicion by Britain and France. Krasnov also made contact with the volunteer army that was clinging on for survival in the south. The commander of the volunteer army was Anton Denikin. Denikin was a man of humble origins. His father had actually been a serf. Denikin had risen up the ranks of the military during World War I, and then when the Bolsheviks took power, he had helped form the volunteer army. Denikin and Krasnov agreed to work together to fight the Bolsheviks, and Krasnov gave the volunteer army weapons. However, because of Krasnov's pro-German views, the relationship would always be tense. Relations were also strained because Krasnov would only allow his forces to fight in the volunteer army if he was made supreme commander. That couldn't be accepted by Denikin. He saw Krasnov as a petty and self-interested warlord, only willing to act if he was to benefit personally. In May, Denikin and Krasnov met to decide how to work together and what should be their next objective. The two couldn't agree on what course of action to take. Denikin was in favor of going south to Yekaterinodar, while Krasnov wanted to go north to Tsaritsyn. Unable to agree, the two men set off in different directions. This inability to cooperate was typical of the anti-Bolshevik forces and would be their biggest problem during the war. All the various forces that would fight the Bolsheviks would come to be known as the Whites. The Bolsheviks were the Reds. May of 1918 saw the entrance of a new and important faction into the war, the Czech Legion. They were roughly 40,000 men from Czechoslovakia, one of the many small states under the dominion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Before Russia had pulled out of World War I, the Czech Legion had been fighting for Russia against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was because they wanted Czechoslovakia to get independence. Then, when Russia pulled out of World War I, these men wanted to leave and continue fighting Germany with Britain and France. The Bolsheviks agreed to this. The Legion was to travel almost all the way around the world, going to the eastern tip of Russia and then to the USA and finally back to France. However, relations between the Czech Legion and the Bolsheviks were extremely tense. Both sides distrusted the other and suspected that they would break the agreement. When the Czech Legion reached the town of Chelyabinsk, the Bolsheviks demanded that they be disarmed, which caused the Czech Legion to revolt. They took control of Chelyabinsk and then used the railway to capture numerous other cities in eastern Russia. The Czech Legion also helped Semyonov return to Chita and set himself up as a warlord. Very quickly, the Bolsheviks lost control of almost all of eastern Russia. The Bolsheviks' poor diplomacy with the Czech Legion had cost them a huge amount of territory in the east. 
As they faced hostile forces on all sides, even within the areas that they controlled, there was significant unrest. Many people were angry that the promise to implement a constitution had been broken. There had been an election for a constituent assembly in November of 1917, but the Bolsheviks had won only 23% of the vote, and so they intimidated the assembly into disbanding. That caused significant unrest in Bolshevik-controlled areas. In July, in the town of Yaroslavl, an anti-Bolshevik network organized a revolt, demanding that the Constituent Assembly be allowed to convene. Desperately short of weapons, the rebels were quickly defeated. There was also a revolt in Moscow by former Bolshevik allies, unhappy with the peace with Germany. That too was quickly suppressed. Then, in August, there was an assassination attempt on Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin. The Bolshevik response was to embark on a policy of exterminating anyone who they thought might be a threat. Modelled on the reign of terror in the French Revolution, tens of thousands of people were murdered by the Bolshevik secret police. This brutal policy came to be known as the Red Terror. The white forces were also incredibly brutal and they would kill tens of thousands of people in what became known as the White Terror. In contrast with the Red Terror, this wasn't an explicit policy with objectives, but rather spontaneous, senseless violence. Back on the front line in the south, Danikin was having success. In August, he was able to capture Yekaterinodar. At the same time, Krasnov had surrounded Tsaritsyn and was attacking the city. However, the Bolsheviks were able to repulse the attacks. In the north, 1,500 British and French troops landed in Arkhangelsk and quickly occupied the city. From there, they pushed south along the Davina River until they were stalled by Bolshevik resistance. In the east, the Bolsheviks were seeing success and captured several cities. If the Whites were going to have any chance of winning, it was clear that they needed to unite and cooperate. In the aftermath of the Bolshevik takeover, many different governments had formed that hoped to be the main white authority. In September of 1918, they united to become one government known as the Provisional All-Russian Government with its capital in Omsk. However, only two months later, the government would be dissolved after a coup by Alexander Kolchak. Kolchak, not to be confused with Krasnov in the south, had been an admiral in the Russian Navy fighting the Germans in World War I. When Russia pulled out of the war, he considered himself on a bound to continue fighting the Germans and offered to fight for the British. Unable to serve as an admiral in the British Navy, he had even offered to fight as a humble private. The British Foreign Secretary had personally accepted the offer and Kolchak was sent to fight in Iraq. Then, when the Russian Civil War broke out, the British changed their minds and decided that Kolchak would actually be more useful fighting the Bolsheviks and so he was transferred back to Russia. In November, Kolchak took control of the white government in a coup and became supreme commander of the white forces in the east. He immediately began planning an advance west. By the end of 1918, Danikin's offensive in the North Caucasus was complete. He now had control of all of the territory from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea. Krasnov, under pressure from Britain and France, was forced to submit to Danikin, who became supreme commander of the white forces in the south. In the north, the Whites were struggling to make any real progress against the Bolsheviks. The British were frustrated that the Russian men that they were trying to train were performing badly and sometimes refusing to fight. In April, the Allied powers made the decision to leave. In the coming months, all of the British, French and American troops would be evacuated. The few Russians that remained fighting the Bolsheviks were quickly defeated. The Bolsheviks were also making progress in the east. Kolchak's offensive had been able to take some territory, but he was struggling to hold it. He had hoped that the peasants would rebel in his favour, but that didn't happen. In April, the Bolsheviks began a large counterattack and took several cities. By July, they were in Yekaterinburg and Chelyabinsk. The loss of those cities cost the Whites the few factories that they had. To make matters worse, Britain and France were beginning to doubt whether the White Army had any hope. They were frustrated that many of the weapons that they were supplying were getting stolen, even ending up in the hands of the Bolsheviks. Semyonov in the east had been seizing much of the aid intended for Kolchak. Believing that the white cause was lost, the Western powers withdrew their support. <laughs> 
As Kolchak in the east was struggling, in the south, Danikin was having success and pushed west into Ukraine. Here, the whites weren't actually fighting the Bolsheviks, but a group of anarchists that had allied with the Bolsheviks. The anarchists were led by Nestor Makhno, who wanted to create a totally stateless society. The white army was pushing back Makhno's forces, and in June, they took Kharkiv. That same month, the whites finally took Tsaritsyn, and now Danikin set his sights on Moscow. He made good progress north and in October took the town of Oriol. Danikin's forces were now only 300 kilometers from Moscow. Victory seemed imminent. However, the Whites had advanced extremely rapidly and had left themselves overextended. Unable to consolidate their gains, their supply lines were vulnerable. The forces of Makhno were able to take advantage of this and advanced east, meeting little resistance. White forces had to be sent to counter the threat, weakening their forces in the north. This allowed the Bolsheviks to launch a counterattack and recapture the lost ground. October of 1919 saw a totally new and very brief front of the war in the Baltics. It was led by Nikolai Yudinich. Yudinich was a former officer in the Russian military, and when the Russian Civil War had broken out, he had advocated for a front in the Baltics. Now he would get his wish. A white army with British tanks advanced into Russia and made it to the outskirts of Petrograd. However, Yudinich didn't destroy the railway connecting to Moscow, allowing the Bolsheviks to send reinforcements. The defense of the city was led by Leon Trotsky. Trotsky was the main Bolshevik general during the war and his military reforms had significantly improved the Red Army. He was an incredible speaker and was able to inspire and persuade with his rhetoric. Led by Trotsky, the Bolsheviks were able to repulse the attack and within a month, Yudinich's forces were back in Estonia. In the east, the White Army was beginning to fail. By November, the Bolsheviks were within striking distance of the White capital, Omsk. They had about 100,000 men to the Whites 50,000. Due to confusion at the top of the White Command, the defense of the city was hugely ineffective and it fell to the Bolsheviks on November the 14th. 30,000 white soldiers were captured by the Bolsheviks. With the loss of Omsk, the white forces in the east fell apart. Kolchak resigned his position and gave command to Semyonov, who was headquartered in Chita. The Bolsheviks continued advancing east and the remaining whites scrambled to get away in what became known as the Great Siberian Ice March. 30,000 white army soldiers and their families were forced to march 2,000 kilometers east to Chita. Many froze to death. On the southern front, the Whites were continuing to lose ground. In December, they lost almost all of Ukraine, and in January, Tsaritsyn and Rostov fell. Eventually, Denikin was forced to evacuate his army, and 40,000 soldiers were taken to Crimea. 30,000 people who weren't evacuated were executed by the Bolsheviks. After this, Denikin resigned his position and gave power to his second-in-command, Peter Wrangel. Wrangel was an excellent cavalry commander and had been one of the most competent generals of the war. He gathered all the remaining white forces in Crimea, the whites' final stronghold in the south. He would spend the next few months trying to break out of Crimea and take territory on mainland Ukraine. That would prove unsuccessful. Eventually, Wrangel's forces were overwhelmed by the Reds and in November, they were forced to evacuate to Istanbul. The whites in the south had been defeated. That same month, the Bolsheviks were also able to defeat the forces of Semyonov in the east. Semyonov had been able to hold on to Chita while he'd had support from the Japanese, but when the Japanese forces were withdrawn, he was overwhelmed by the Red Army. In November, he was forced to abandon Chita and fled to China. The Whites' last foothold in Russia had fallen. With the defeat of Semyonov and the capture of Crimea, the Bolsheviks had defeated their main opposition. However, they would continue to face rebellions, sometimes involving hundreds of thousands of rebels. In the city of Tambov, the politician Alexander Antonov was opposed to the forced confiscation of grain and was able to raise an army of 20,000 peasants. The rebellion turned into a guerrilla war which lasted for two years. The Bolsheviks sent 100,000 men to crush the uprising and even used poison gas to clear the forests of rebels. In March of 1921, on the island of Kotlin near Petrograd, 10,000 sailors rebelled against the Bolsheviks. Those men had fought for the Bolshevik government, but were dissatisfied with how the revolution was being managed. 
They demanded a reduction of Bolshevik power and the inclusion of socialist and anarchist groups into the revolution. The Bolsheviks raided the island with tens of thousands of men and within three weeks the rebellion was crushed. The largest uprising was the West Siberian Rebellion, which may have involved as many as 100,000 peasants. For a time, the Bolsheviks again lost control of much of Siberia, including Omsk and Yekaterinburg. The uprising would last almost two years, but was eventually crushed. As the Bolsheviks consolidated power, they immediately set about building their communist utopia, which would cost the lives of tens of millions of people. In May of 1922, Lenin had the first of three strokes, and so his power quickly began to wane. The ensuing power struggle would be won by one of the most significant men in all of history, Joseph Stalin. Stalin would take Russia from the power vacuum of the Civil War to one of the most absolute dictatorships the world has ever known. He would also build a state geographically very similar to the old Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. That would be one of the two superpowers on Earth for decades to come.